Matt Gion, welcome to The Mentor. Nice to be here. Thank you, Mark. I am fascinated with what you do and what you're trying to achieve. But um, it's a long way from where you kicked off in the business world. Uh, yeah, it let's, is. Let's. I, I wouldn't mind just finding out where you started from. And, you know, like when people like you or your organisation goes out to talk to, you know, people who might may invest in your business uh, from an equity point of view to support what you're doing, you know, help you reach milestones, make a better, healthier world, they do like to hear the story. Um, and uh, you're the guy who's driving this thing, so tell me about it. Like maybe you just assume that I'm a potential investor because I think this would be a good opportunity to do that. So my first question to you is where did you start off? My background's mainly uh, in advertising, so advertising agencies both here and, and in the UK, um, and I was a creative director in advertising. But not always. How did you start off? Yeah, well, I, I went to uni, Yep. but I um, didn't pay much attention at uni. Um, so it's, uh, that's one of those things. Um, I didn't from Sydney? I'm from Sydney. Yeah. yeah. Out at Castle Hill. Yeah. Um, Castle where yeah. I grew up. And what, was, what did your parents do? What, what, what was the deal? Yeah. So my mother was a Montessori teacher, which is a, a yep. different form of education. And my father was an engineer. Well, let's stop there. What's different about Montessori? Well, um, it depends who you speak to, but what I would say is it kind of focuses more on the individual child and what they naturally gravitate towards and, um, kind of fosters a curious mind i guess in in the beginning so not so formally structured as as um other forms of education um for instance one thing you know and these are little things but i think they're important in terms we're going to probably talk about the brain later one thing i remember learning to write in montessori oh you uh, went to a Montes you went to one of those schools yes yeah. yes early early days um but to learn to write and to write cursive they had letters in sandpaper and you actually trace the sandpaper with your finger, which made a different type of connection to learning how to write. And that's just kind of one small example of maybe some of the differences and the tools that Montessori use. A different, different sensory connection. Exactly. Being um, the touch, the skin being the largest organ, but the skin having lots of nerve endings and the skin ha having the ability to ascertain a sense uh, through its sensory. And then that gets pushed down to the, through the nervous system back up to the brain and the brain has some sort of connection back to that, that feeling. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Okay, that's cool. So you went to a Montessori school. So it's a bit offbeat, particularly maybe how old are you now, 40, 50? Yeah, old, yeah, my 40, mid 40s. Okay, so, yep. you know, 40 years ago, that was a bit out there. Montessori is not normal. Yeah. I mean, it's <laughs> more normal today. What did your dad do? I was an engineer, so mechanical engineer, very analytical, um, kind of set up and, and ran factories for a long time. So we moved around a lot when I was younger. So I was actually born in Sudan, which is North Africa. And then we moved probably six or seven times before we came to Sydney. Like two opposite ends. Yeah. Which way do you tend towards? Probably more the the creative side, the idea side of, of things and the, I'd say, less analytical or detailed side, but the more the, the bigger thinking, idea chasing. People who think that way can be accused of being dreamers. Yeah. I think you need to be realistic. And that's one of the things I think I've learned over my business career, let's say, is you've got to be realistic about what you're doing, what business you're entering and what you're trying to achieve. So it's always good to remind yourself of that. The other thing which I think is important that advertising gave me is, is structure. So good advertising is basically strategy and execution, right? You can't just go out there, well, a lot of people can, with an idea and a dream and chuck it out there and expect it to work. You've got to have a good strategy, uh, a really sound strategy, and you've got to be able to execute. So they're the two things that I always keep in mind and apply it to whatever I'm I'm doing, we've got to have a strong foundation. Can't just enter a different category or, or business and then expect it to work. You've got to do your homework, do your reps, so to speak. Um, and then you've got to be able to execute. And if you can't do that, um, I don't, I think you stand less chance of being successful. Yeah. So advertising agencies aren't like, um, I think it was Darren out of Bewitched, who's always <laughs> sort of coming up with a pitch and uh, trying to win a new client over and, you know, and have some of these fantastic uh, storyboards. I used to think, wow, that's that's a just a, like an artistic job. You do that creative stuff, but there's a lot of structure to it. Yeah, there is. If you want to be successful and if you want your client to get a disproportionate return on investment, which is the whole idea, right? Yeah. Spend less and, and get more. It's moth-like. In other words, clients will go to the brightest light 
yeah. every time. They don't give a <laughs> shit. Exactly. Um, and if something doesn't work, even though it was their idea, they'll blame the agency or the creative. How old were you when you first started the agency? Straight out of uni, basically, I was lucky enough to get a, a job or a, or a placement, what they call, in an agency and then a, a job at George Patterson Bates, which was big one. Huge one, yeah, which was great because kind of getting the back end of the 80s or 90s there, advertising a lot of old Famous people like Bryce Courtney had an office. Good, interesting people that were around. I managed to get a job in Singapore at a great agency and then back here and then over to London. So 15 years in, in total. What did you learn about being exposed to advertising clients? Well, inevitably, um, a couple of things. One is is the commercial aspects of business. So because you're exposed or I was exposed to all sorts of clients across different categories from banking you know, to entertainment, consumer goods, past moving consumer goods, uh, to tech companies, you really get to see what pressure they face and how they manage that pressure and what the milestones they have to hit um, because you're kind of in part of that to a certain extent uh, and the commercial aspects of that, which drives a, a lot of or almost everything. And then the other thing I think is just learning how to package and become a, a better storyteller around a, a product or a company, which isn't easy. It sounds easy. But it really isn't. It takes a long time to be able to get to that place, to be able to effectively tell people what you're doing or describe what you're doing. Just understanding the story from the beginning, like, and how deep into the story or deep into the weeds do you go, apart from knowing how to tell the story? Yeah. I mean, or how to display the story. I mean, that that's sort of more the creative side. But the analytical side of you um, probably assists you in actually digging the story up. Yeah. Because unfortunately, you know, like we all live this world, but – a lot of times executives, big executives and big organisations who might have been in five organisations over 25 years don't have enough roots in the story themselves. They're just, they're, they're just termers, you know, like it happens in our banking system all the time. You know, dudes get appointed CEO, five-year appointment, and they're off and running. And yeah. They take the big earn, they go somewhere else. They don't really have a sense of the joint. So what do you think is the constraints that exist in relation to people being able to tell a story today about their business? Yeah, well, one is understanding what your core competitive advantage is and being able to articulate that in a persuasive way or a meaningful way. So that's probably one constraint and being able to really narrow that down. The second one would just be, firstly, from an advertising perspective, understanding what the brand is. So, for example, it's better when the CEO is aligned integrate into the marketing department, right? So Wizard's probably a good example Mm. because that's your company. You are the part of the brand. One of the constraints is when that's disconnected to your point where CEOs aren't really connected to the marketing department. That's the case in a lot of companies. Do you think proprietors in appointing a CEO have got to think hard and long about who they appoint and how quickly that CEO can actually adopt the mantra or the, the narrative yeah, yeah, when you're talking about a brand, it's critical. Not a, for e- even to efficiency, day to day functioning, because inevitably, the more layers you have, the more layers whatever we create, if you're an agency, has to go up. And if none of them are connected, they have different priorities or agendas. They don't know what the core story is. They don't know what the brand stands for. Your chances of selling in anything um, or doing anything effective are, are really slim. So if you're looking at a CEO, they have to have a core marketing sensibility or branding sensibility of any organisation. If they're not aligned to that, it's very, very difficult. I mean, I always talk about people should hold hackathons with everybody in the business, like from for everybody. Yeah, I think that's a useful idea. And I'll tell you why, because it creates context. And context is so critical and often missed in organisations from an internal level with your staff, of just about what why are we doing this? Uh, and what's the context around it. And also from a, a business operations point of view, whether you're capital raising, uh, you've got to have context around the market, zoom out every now and then. If you don't have that context, it can seem like a very lonely place. It can seem like you're doing the wrong thing. Depressing even. Depressing even, exactly. So what you just described there is a way to establish context for everyone, but also create useful tools to get different voices in and understand what you're doing with the brand and where you want to go. This collaboration initiation ceremony, I think is really critical. I mean, I th- a big mistake I see people make is they just get a person from consultancy organisations. Yep. Oh, he, he or she's got fantastic cred. Poor bastard doesn't know anything. Um, you know, it's it's just pushing shit uphill. Yeah, and the organism rejects it, right? There's yeah. a, I'm sure you've found in in the past there's an energy and a culture that that kind of just emerges. Some sometimes, um, you know, helped along a bit, but. And that, that's really interesting in terms of the intangible things that happen with that is any newcomer coming in that doesn't really uh, 
subscribe to that or fit in or understand it instantly gets rejected by that culture. And that's a really good filter, I think, for that. I, I think that's important. You've got to protect that energy and, and momentum and all those intangible things that you've got in the business um, through that filter. And it kind of tells you, it gives you feedback if you pay attention to it. That's an interesting word to use, energy. You're now way out of those advertising environments. You're in genomics, pretty much totally different. <laughs> yeah. Um, but also not that different. What is genomics for a start? So genomics is the information that we get from what's called sequencing uh, your molecular biology. So your, what's happening molecularly in, in each one of us, we're now able to get a picture of that through what's called sequen sequencing. So your genome, yep, um, which we all have, and DNA and RNA mainly is, yep. is what we can now look at in precise detail. Scientists through apparatus and means can build a mathematical sequence that sits on our gene uh, or our DNA yep. um, or an, our ribonucleic acid, which is RNA, um, either way, um, and can actually make predictions about certain things. And sometimes you can change the sequence and or predict what happens when two sequences merge, male yep. and female. It's a new field, relatively speaking, new field. It's been around a while, but it's relatively speaking a new field. And you used the word energy before about a business and its brand and senior management and, and every other part of the business. And then when I look at cells, I immediately think about energy and uh, and the brain responding yep. to what we sense. And a certain energy arises as a result of electrical interchange in the brain between the various cells in the brain, the neurons, yep. you know, where positive uh, ions move from one part of the brain to another part of the brain and they create reactions and it might be something that tells you to produce adrenaline, uh, your adrenal gland, which sort of might start off in the starts off in the hypothalamus as a result of something you ex you see hits the hypothalamus hypothalamus and sends a note to something else something else sends a pituitary gland and then it sends something another chemical to the adrenal gland yep. and then we get a response but there's an energy attached to that what do I mean by that electrical energy yeah and even in business you've got to have that electrical energy too it's it's not seen you can't see it, but you can't see the electrical energy around body no and I, I find what you doing is what you're doing now is quite fascinating did you actually perceive the likeness of what you did when you consulted to big organizations trying to work out their brand and the energy within the brand to what you are doing with genome therapy. So the one thing I love doing the most is solving difficult problems. It really excites me. I'm passionate about it, whether that's in from an advertising, marketing or business perspective, or when you're looking at the genome. So that's one thing which translated across. This is one of the most difficult problems to solve probably right now in the world in terms of neurodegenerative diseases. Extraordinarily complex, as you just, just described, we've got 3.5 billion bits of information in each of us. Nothing really happens in isolation. So it's all a network and interconnected. Mm. So solving problems, and this is one of the biggest ones of our time, I think, is, is not only important, but it, it gets me excited. And the second element of that is, again, to your translational point, is strategy and execution. So the first thing I thought about was, is there an opportunity? Like what's going to be the strategy if I'm going to be doing this and there's millions of or hundreds of very talented people in the world, probably more qualified than me, definitely more qualified. In a scientific sense. Scientific sense. Where's the opportunity? Well, how did that transition occur? I came back from the UK five years ago and didn't want to go back in advertising. I thought I'd done my time there, done quite well uh, and wanted to look at something else. And I met a, a person with ALS, motor neuron disease. Yep. Uh, and just started. Just stop. Stop there. Yeah. Just explain what MND is, what motor neuron disease is, and now ALS is one form of motor neuron disease. That's explain, right. Explain what we're talking about here. And there's probably more subtypes we haven't identified yet, but but these are a, a neurodegenerative uh, disease. Motor neuron disease is where where basically if it can be a mutation, an inherited mutation in a small percentage of cases that starts to drive the pathology of the disease. So either through what we call protein aggregation, you know, similar to Alzheimer's where we have a dysfunctional protein that's clumping up, that's aggregating, becoming toxic, and then eventually affecting the motor neurons. Some of them die, some of them may get switched off, and those motor neurons control our function and basically our motor functions, and they're the things that start to get affected first. That's interesting. So uh, what was interesting to me is the way you explained it. 
maybe you don't speak to investors like that. But let's say I was an investor because we said that's how we started. Um, that lost me. Yeah. Well, and now, now, can I just help you a bit? Can yes, I, please and do. And I'll tell you why. You know, please do. M and D is very close to my heart. Right. My mother passed away with motor neuron disease. Okay. And she was one of the people who had a gene mutation. Right. And she, she so she carried this mutation in her system her whole life until she was eighty six years of age. Yes. Which can happen. Yes. Other people don't don't get it from the mutation. They get it from you know like. They can get it at 25 years of age or 30 years of age. But my mother carried this mutation on her gene or in her sequencing, on her genetic sequencing, whole life. Didn't know. Then she got, and maybe you can use this as an example because this yep. is the best way, I think the best way to tell a story. Then okay. she got a severe respiratory disease, which is one of the four or five things they say that can set the mutation off. So a brain and mind center at uh, mm -hmm. Sydney University or out there at Camperdown where she was treated and diagnosed, et cetera, by the neurologists that they have discovered or others have discovered along with their own work that there are a number of things that can set the mutation off, one of which is exposure to chemical exposure. So you could have been exposed to um, something when you're a young person, some poisons, you know, that could have been used in those days in a, if you're a farmer and cattle, like, et cetera. Or uh, that's one. Second one is alcoholism um, can mm -hmm. bring the mutation on. Third one that I remember is severe respiratory disease like glandular fever or something along that. COVID, for example, would be one where you got bad long term COVID and bad COVID. And what it does is it sets this mutation off, and all of a sudden you get motor neuron disease. And so she she got a really bad flu. She lost twenty kilos. We didn't know what was going on. She, you know, she was old, so she finding breathing difficult, etc. We just thought she had a bad flu, went on for ages, and anyway, eventually got cured. But six months later, she got motor neuro disease, and as you know, it's there's no turning back once you get it. You know, six months later, she was dead. Um, but all her movement and motor skills were turned off. Yes, basically, the brain just turned them off. What I find fascinating because it's, it's a shitty thing, <laughs> and I have a bad memory of it. But I, what I find fascinating about it is how it gets described. Because it's very complicated because that's Correct. one example. So, exactly. And if, if I can try and describe it, and this is the problem. So, And it's a very good point you're raising because, you know, everyone wants the elevator pitch, which I can I can give the one-liner. We're trying to solve ALS through genomics, right, yeah. power genomics. Yeah. But when they go how. Yeah, and what's ALS? Yeah. And how do I know if someone's going to get it or whatever? If you're looking for a simple answer, it's very hard because these are very complex diseases that present very differently depending on each individual. A lot of individual variation, a lot of what they call clinical modifiers, like, like you said, you know, the cause can be a multiple of things. And then the gene or the genetic mutations or makeup can also be a multiple number of things. Patients can present the same way to a neurologist, so have the same symptoms, but have a different mutation. Or they can have different symptoms and the same mutation. So this is what we're dealing with right in 2022. So there's lots of variables. Lots of variables. And how can we start to stratify those into distinct subtypes um, using genomics, using multi, what we call multiomics, different layers? When you layers. say using genomics, you mean by studying the genes of the various people that who may be suffering from it, how can you derive categories? Yes, exactly. From the sequence on their gene. Exactly. So if we look at the endpoint, where do we want to end up? It's we can then profile a subtype and say, look, you've got these two or three mutations. In the past, pro probably up until the last couple of years, we've only, or a lot of people have only been looking at one type of genomic information called a whole genome sequence. And that's, and of that, they, they look at what's called the exome. So 25,000 genes. And they do these things called genome-wide association studies. Now that's been great to identify a number of ALS associated genes, but pretty much none of them are actionable. You can't act on them. Right. And what we're now finding, you can sequence longer sections of the genome called long read sequencing, and you can find things, little variations or big variations called structural variants, which are implicated or could be implicated in the disease. So it's very, this is very dense. Very dense. You know, if we strung our DNA to out to the sun and back, it'd, it'd be about five times. So you're looking at these compressed bits of information, huge bits of information take up lots of lots of data in each individual. And sometimes you only need one change in, in a sequence, one little letter difference to cause a disease. So that's what you're de dealing with. It is a little bit of a needle in a haystack, 
But because of technology, it's more like, you know, we could find 100 needles in the same haystack. I can see where your advertising experience of 15 years <laughs> becomes critical. Yeah. Taking someone's hand, like an investor, for example, through the weeds, it's a difficult one. It is because the brain's complex, right? Yeah. And the body's complex. Molecular biology is complex. Okay. Well, I, th this complexity already is uh, giving me a headache um, because, but I'm, but I'm extraordinarily interested in it. So, what I want to do is uh, let's go to the break, have a sure. cup of tea, and um, we'll come back. Fantastic. I'm here with Matt Kern. Now we're talking, we're in the weeds here talking <laughs> about uh, gene mutations and motor neuron disease and, and or ALS and lots of stuff. I mean, it's, it's complex, but it's worth listening to. And, and I think one of the reasons why I find it worth listening to, that, that value in it, is this. What actually happened was I ring my mother. My mother doesn't drink, doesn't drink alcohol. Um, my mother's of Irish genetics, okay, fully Irish genetics. I used to remember that um, every night or at least every second night on my way home from work to home because, you know, being of Irish descent, she talked her head off. And, um, you know, I thought, well, if I could talk to mum from the moment, I leave the office to the moment, get home and say, mum, I come home. I've got to go inside now. I, at least I could have a nice sort of <laughs> beginning and end. Yeah. Otherwise, mum will talk to me forever. So, and one night I was driving home talking to her. It was in May. And uh, a May uh, four years ago, and she said uh, she was like slurring her words a bit. The sort of sound you yep. get from someone who's drinking. And my dad doesn't drink, either, but he'll have occasional scotch or something. And I said, "Hey, mum, have you had a whiskey with dad?" And then uh, she said, "No, love, I you know you know I don't drink, blah blah." blah. And uh, I said, oh, "That's odd, because you're sort of slurring your words a bit." She said, "Ah, oh, yeah." She said. It's, she had a few problems with her jaw and her teeth and stuff. She says, it's probably my teeth. She just been to the dentist. So, okay. Anyway, it went on for a while. And I saw a friend of mine at St. Vincent's Hospital right next, right here near Exo Studio, and he's a urologist. And I said to him, hey, Phil, mate, can you, mate, uh, mum's, this happened to my mum. But he said, you should see a neurologist. And I said, oh, mate, trying to get into Vincent's, trying to get a neurologist is impossible. He said, I'll get John on one. So he sent me to a neurologist in St. Vincent's. We went and saw the neurologist. All the tests were done, blah, blah, blah. We got called back in. And I remember when we walked back into the see the neurologist, um, she said, um, my dad and me and mum were there. And she's, he, she said to mum, look, look, my diagnosis is you've got motor neuron disease. Now, my mm. mother had been, my mother's very well read and been researching everything. And she was trying to hope that that's not what it was going to be. Yeah. And, um, we all nearly fell off the chair and my mother's response was, first response was, is it able to be passed on to my children and to my grandchildren and my great-grandchildren? -grand -great so she was more interested in all of us than herself. Yeah. And the second thing is she said, how long do I have? Those were the two questions. Um, and my mother is normally quite loquacious, like, you know, unstoppable in some respects, but that she had two she, like that she was ready, prepared for the question, two short questions. The first question was, yes, it can be passed on mm -hmm. um, genetically, which is your territory, um, and uh, B, you don't have long um, because of your age. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah, and so and, uh, that was it was quite a heavy sort of meeting. And then we ended up going out. We were then referred on to the specialist or the mob that were doing research, which is the Brain and Mind Centre. When we went to the Brain and Mind Centre, the neurologist said to me, to us, this is an, a, a Celtic or an Irish gene. She said it's it's very prevalent on people with Irish parents and or history and or Celtic. Right. Um, so it's Scottish and Irish. And, and she said, the guy said, in Ireland, one person per day gets diagnosed with motor neuron disease, mm -hmm. either because of alcoholism, crossing over the mutation, or exposure to poisons, or having a, had a severe respiratory disease, and with all this COVID stuff, it's been in my head. Yeah, um, I got COVID, and I thought to myself, I didn't get it too bad, which is good. But I, I wondered to myself, should I go and get genetically tested? And I haven't done that. Okay, it's not easy to get done, by the way. Uh, I, you would know that. I yeah, found it quite you need difficult. ethics approval. Yeah, we and... have to go through this process. Yeah, you have to go and meet someone and say. I don't know what they say. I haven't been to meet someone. Genetic what, counselor. What, what is that? Genetic counselor. Why? Why, yeah. why do they want to talk to me? Because it's a it's a great question, and, and it's something which I think we need to have more of uh, this conversation around it. It's because not everything you find uh, 
in the genome um, is is real. Sometimes they're errors or what we call artifacts. Sometimes you can have a mutation, but the degree of penetrance, right, the degree that we find in other people isn't high. So we're unsure. We call these variants of unknown significance. So there's a lot of things in the genome that we might find that could be causing the disease, but we don't know how to interpret it yet. We need to do a series of other experiments. So genetic counsel is important in, in being able to talk to you about the things we do know about, um, but also to give you an indication of where we're at with the things we don't know about. And there's a lot of, it's a very gray area at the moment because there's a lot of sequencing going on. And you we mean the science or the counseling is gray? Uh, the science right. on, on the, the genome. It's like a moving target because we're getting more precise technology and we're finding more and more things. And we, we kind of don't know how to interpret those at the best we can yet. We will soon. And, and so there's, a, I guess, an ethical obligation um, that exists in, in, that, in that realm and that needs to be navigate, navigated. There's also privacy concerns, insurance concerns, all of these things that come up, which I don't think should stop research or companies like ours that are trying to, to solve it. But we need to find better ways to navigate them so we can get to answers sooner, more effective answers. And actually a, a genetic counsellor is one way we can do that, um, is to present information to a genetic counsellor and a neurologist, and then they can make a decision of how they interpret that to the patient. And to some extent it's sort of what you do, a Ginny Us does, proposing to do, is at the end of the day it's my information. Can't, why can't I just say, listen, fuck off, do the test, I'll pay the bill yep. and just let me know the information or is this nanny state shit? Like, uh, you know. No, wherever, you, you could do that of your own accord under No, but I don't think you can. I? I can? You could if you really wanted to. Yeah, yeah, Absolutely. Yeah. A mate of mine who's a, a prof down here at St Vincent's and, and, I, and his father died of dementia and his father was a, a well-known professor at, Sydney, at St Vincent's as well. And, uh, and I said, hey, Mark, his name's Mark too. I said, mate, have you decided, have you gone, decided to go and get genome testing for dementia? Um, you know, I don't know. I just, I just asked him, and he said to me, because I'm thinking about doing it for motor neuron disease. And he said, "Oh, mate, why would you bother?" He said, "Because even if they can see the whatever it is on your the sequencing that you have a propensity, perhaps, mm -hmm. to get dementia inherited, they're just going to tell you the the cure is high intensity exercise anyway, blood and nutrients and oxygen into the brain." He said, so I've decided just to do that anyway because it's good for you. And he said, that way I don't have the stress of or, or the anxiety of thinking I might get dementia. Yeah, sometimes it's better not to know. So I, I think there's – But then if you don't know, I, I, I get anxiety by not knowing that. Well, it depends on what type of person you are. Correct. Yeah. yeah. So And, and you could do it. You've got a family history. You could get that done quite quite easily. I, I found it really difficult. I've been trying to get it done. Honestly, man, I've been trying. Really? Okay. Yeah, but, and during COVID, it was very difficult because no one answered the phone. I've been ringing St. Vincent, the Garvin. I've been, I've been, I've been just, and like I keep getting recorded messages and I found it difficult. I ended, I ended up going to the uh, Brain and Mind Centre. BMC, yep. um, and I, I can get assistance there. But then they said, oh, you've got to go through the ethics thing, and I yes. thought, oh, fuck it, too hard. Yeah. Um, I just couldn't be bothered. But then, And now I'm talking to you, I'm thinking about it again. Well, we should talk after the show because I, I think there's a way to do it that's ethically um, sound. So G-E-N-I-E, uh, U-S, as in large U and large S, yep. genius, very clever. Um, sounds like you come from a, a, an advertising <laughs> guy. Yeah. yeah, But it's very clever. What does genius do? Do so. Our mission is is to solve ALS and through two ways. One, um, we want to sequence as many motor neuron disease patients as possible, both here and across the world. In uh, patients or potential patients? Patients, patients. People have got it. Yeah. People diagnose it. But let's come back to potential patients. That's a yeah. great uh, point, Mark, and I think we should talk about about that um, set after this. Yep. Yeah. Um, but yeah, but sequence as many as we can to identify these subtypes. And yep. then what we want to do, so we build a number of pipelines which can analyse this information and we find things. We find a lot of things actually. So we being you and all your scientists and uh, yeah, I, I, know, I looked on your website, lots of PhD dudes in there. Yeah, and, phenomenal people. Yeah, so and th these people would be people with PhDs um, who have specialised, they might even not be medical doctors, but they have they specialised in um, MND in relation to motor neurons, the, the, the neurons that, run your motor skills, your hands, and your, your ability to swallow and smell and move and that sort of stuff. Is that, is that what we're talking about, yeah. these PhD dudes? Yeah, so structurally we have a research department which researches this, gets across all the literature, designs experiments, Yeah, and we have a computational biology, so com 
computer scientists. Yeah, so you have a, so yeah, okay. So, because I was, I was curious about that. So computational informatics on the brain or parts of the brain or neurons, or in your case, specifically motor neurons. Yep. Because I sort of do understand it, is um, computer scientists or programmers building programs which sometimes use artificial intelligence or learning software to learn from the inputs about likely outcomes based on statistical models and that they build these programs to which suck up all the information so you need lots of data yep into there which spits out outcomes potential outcomes only potential statistically potential outcomes so it's statistical it's not it's not factual. <laughs> it's it's a, it's a statistic significance as opposed to anything else. Sometimes, yeah. If, sometimes, if you're employing those those models, so we we don't we do that because you've got to do that as a hygiene factor. And, and it's modeling, though, isn't it? It is. It's modeling. Yeah, we, the, we build a number of machine learning models, but the important part about that is what question you're trying to ask of that model. Right. There's no good just in getting models and putting them against data or getting data and trying to write models to it. It's, it's kind of useless in a way. You've got to be very focused and specific. So our question is what's happening in what tissue and why in the body? So the peripheral immune system to the brain as well to the spinal cord because that's where we see the pathology mostly um, and in particular the spinal cord, not the brain. You see the disease expressing itself yes. mostly in the spinal cord. Yes, and then obviously into the brain, um, which is, is kind of a natural progression. But to, just to give an indication, and, and this is where it gets complex, but also interesting perhaps um, for everyone listening and, and yourself, is that obviously your genes, or maybe not obviously, but but they express differently in different tissues, right? Mm -hmm. Not the same. Some ubiquitously, ubiquitously express, but others don't. Like skin colour, for example. Yes. Yeah. And so... What we do is we take um, blood and we get DNA and RNA from that, but we also take sections of spinal cord from autopsied patients and we look at that and also brain tissue and we look at that. And then we try and integrate all that information to look for different patterns that are different between ALS and motor neuron disease patients and healthy controls. That's kind of a basic starting point. So can I just point. stop you there just so I can understand because you know, I, I want, I'm the investor, okay? So yeah. if I could be broad about it and I'm not trying to do, do you a disservice in the complexity, but basically data about from tissues from a brain, from the spinal column, spinal mm -hmm. cord, and from blood. Correct. Okay. And you're looking for specific things and you take the data from those three places and you feed that into a software program which has received lots of other data from lots of other interesting situations and you hope there is some machine – there's some learning going on there where it actually says, look, based on all the other stuff and that what we just received from you, this is what we think. Yes. Is that right? That's so correct. One, you need access to data. This yep. means you need access to people who consent to you to look at what it is that might have killed them. Yep. And then – the second thing you need is, uh, you know, hold these smart guys and girls who are sitting around there who can build these models, their software, you know, That's programmers. Right. And then you need someone who can interpret that shit and uh, take it somewhere. And validate it. So we also need to validate, which yeah. is we have what's called patient in a dish models. So we take a bit of your skin, we turn that into a stem cell, and we turn that stem cell into motor neurons and astrocytes, which are the immune cells of the brain. So we, if anything we find in the computer, so to speak, we can then validate through a patient cell model or a brain in a dish model, right. which is really important because a lot of times, again, you get some errors, it doesn't turn out. But let me just give you an example of one, our research um, study we did where we found we we're able to sequence parents and a patient. And we found this one mutation that hadn't been described before in ALS and it's called a de novo mutation. So this just occurs uh, consequent to embryogenesis, right? It's not an inherited mutation, but mm -hmm. occurs because both mother and father are carrying certain variants that create this mutation. And so it looked to be pathogenic driving the disease. And so we then took that mutation, put it into a healthy motor neuron model to see if we can see it expressing and creating a phenotype, a disease model. And it did. Then we screened drugs against it uh, and we found a few that are hit. So that's one possible avenue for treatment, condensed into a short space of time for me to explain it. But that's why sometimes we find common mutations across a population and sometimes we find individual ones. My thinking is it's not single mutations that are driving this disease at all. It's, it's what you'd call a, a burden of mutations, maybe two or three. Maybe the younger you are, the more your burden load is. 
the older you are, it's less. But these things triggered by something, and it could be a range of things, then flip over threshold and start working together in a way to drive the disease. If we can identify those two or three things, uh, we can then target them with treatment. For example, RNA therapies, which everyone's probably familiar with, with COVID or messenger RNA replacements, depending on the type of mutation. That's mRNA, which is yes. what we're all familiar with as a result of Pfizer and um, others. Yes. ALS, MND, motor neuron disease is quite a well spread across our community. I mean, it, there's a whole lot of people who raise money for it. I mean, I, rugby league greats, you know, mm-hmm. I just said all the time, okay? You know, and, and since I've become more interested in it, all of a sudden I've seen a lot more people get involved in it, raising money for it, et cetera, it's mostly charitable type things. Yeah. I mean, they, but they, you know, they're don- donating money for, for research because of someone close to them has been affected by this thing. Why the fuck hasn't someone come up with a solution or hasn't this been sped up at the same speed that we can do something like a COVID mRNA response? What, tell me, what is that? Is it politics? What is it? Well, it's it's a range of things, I think. Um, but it's a, it's a great question, Mark. So I think part of it is if, if you let, – let's go back to – I think the answer is going to be a mixture of commercial – and academia. So let's start at the answer. I think you need the commercial impetus as a driver to actually solve this disease properly. I don't think it's going to come purely out of academia. And that's not, you know, dismissing academia. We've got fantastic scientists in this country working on this disease, like unparalleled, to be honest. But that when you apply for a grant in an academic institution, it's very specific and it has to be tied to that one thing, right? You can't, you don't have the flexibility if you discover something new to then branch out and start pursuing that. So that's one big limitation of why we haven't made a load of progress. The second thing is there's a huge um, variety of different beliefs about what the disease is. Some people think it's only caused by a certain toxin. Some people think that it's only one gene and keep chasing that single gene. I don't think we're in that place anymore. I think the, the field has moved forward. I think people are pushing for early screening because we know there's a lot of difference and variability in the indiv- individuals. It's a very hetero genius disease so it, the, the differences are huge so that's another limitation is just people's myopic nature to be honest and that's that, that shouldn't be a surprise unfortunately to scientists get a bit that way though scientists or who, whoever yeah. and we shouldn't be surprised it exists in business it exists everywhere yeah, yeah. and and then the third thing is we're not centralizing and working together enough yeah so it's it's it's, it's split it's split Fa- it's too much friction too much factions but also but also a lot of uh, um, duplication a lot of duplication yeah so we need to, if you look at advancements that were done in HIV or cancer, quite often you can track it back to a central organised effort of data, of intellectual capital and of commercial resources. Well, COVID's a good example. COVID's a perfect example. Yeah. And so we need to be more vocal and push for that in, in this country and more support from the government. There, there aren't grants specific to motor neuron disease or not, aren't enough, in my opinion, given we have the highest incidence in the world Is that right? of motor neuron disease. That's right. So eight like per capita or something? Yeah, per capita. So eight per 100,000 here. rest of the world's about 4.6. Maybe it's something to do with our Irish background or something perhaps. It, it could be. And all different ethnic be- backgrounds um, have different propensities for mutations. Yep. That's right. And we need the government to be more active in this space. And back to your point about patients pre-symptomatic, right, before they get the disease or don't know their patients yet. One of the things which has been successful in the UK and other countries is they've done big genome projects, sequence just 100,000 people blindly. And out of that, they've been able to identify different categories of rare diseases, like genetic differences that haven't been diagnosed. So what that tells you is, if we start to employ that kind of um, program here as well, we can start to have a screening program where we identify these things pre-diagnosis, which I think is the, the next step in innovation to solve these diseases. We want to get ahead of it. And we want to see people that may go on to develop the disease and track them to see how it develops. And then we can get to a place where we go, hey, Mark, you've got this genetic picture. You really shouldn't play rugby league because if you get too much impact, that's probably going to – Well, that's what's – I'll be honest, Matt, that's what's going through me because I boxed all my life. Right. And that's what bothers the shit out of me. Um, oh, yeah, that was just an example, but yeah. But I have. Yeah. And I've actually only recently had um, – uh, my brain uh, scanned. Uh, it's, a, it's a new scanning process, but I, 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 they do it through your eyes, looking at your eyes. It wasn't a brain scan like a proper MRI type thing. It was yep. um, it was a brain scan through. They look into the, the your pupils and uh, 
they can uh, see this this software th- through the hardware can see where where you've had concussions right and uh and they identify a whole lot of concussions which I've, I've obviously had been a boxer so I've had a lot of concussions and the thought was going through my head because my mother hated me boxing right. she was so upset about me boxing not knowing she had motor neuron disease but it was a thing my father's a boxer but my mother hated it and um and I used to actually go and right up until maybe two three years before she passed away I would still be fi- I was still fighting but I wouldn't tell her yeah right because okay. I knew she'd get upset. I just didn't want to upset her, that's all. Um, I wasn't trying to be sneaky, but, you know, I was a 60-year-old going to do what I want. But same, I didn't want to say it. But it's funny because it's like she knew. Yeah. Well, she, yeah. Instinctively, I don't know. But uh, you're, saying like that, that. you're saying that um, head trauma may well be something that you shouldn't do if you get a pre-diagnosis. It's, it's a possibility and that's yeah. where we'd like to end up. Or we might say, Mark, you shouldn't really work in a chemical factory. Yeah, or, correct. You know, whatever it is, and that's where I want, want to end up with this, so we can start to have what we'd call more um, susceptibility scores, and we can have better information in the patient, and that can actually, you know, either lessen their chances of, of a mutation expressing, or we can go on and develop therapies fast. To your COVID point, you know, there's no reason we're working with the same chemistry pretty much as their mRNA vaccines. Why can't we get them into patients quicker, safely? efficacy into patients. There should be no reason, given the death rate, you know, for COVID's, uh, you know, minimal. Um, but for amount of neuron disease, it's pretty much a certainty. Totally. Once you, it's, it's a death sentence once you get it. I mean, you're most likely to you exactly. cark it pretty quick. I mean, like within a period of time, or in, and by the way, in a most dreadful way. Exactly. It's, it's, not, it's, it's you brutal just don't, disease. It's a brutal disease. I mean, my mother had complete... Understanding what she was doing. She's got a little bit of dementia right towards the end, like her brain got fucked up. But prior to that, like she knew exactly what was happening. She knew she could think, but she couldn't taste, smell, swallow, write, speak. Uh, uh, there was a sequence of events. She, when she couldn't speak, she used to write everything. Yeah, I, right. And, I, and then she would, then, then it got to a point where she couldn't write and she would just write a word maybe one word and in fact i kept a whole lot of the pieces of paper when my mother wrote little thing notes to me because i go and visit mum every week about it and she would write everything down she needed to say and i watched the uh deterioration of her ability to write and i've actually kept it all the pieces of paper right um what you can see it in the end it's just like scribble and uh but it, what she was getting was she was trying to tell me how frustrated she was yeah in her mind in her brain because she couldn't get her brain to tell her body to do things. Yeah. In the end, they die of pneumonia. She died of pneumonia uh, you know, because, you know, they can't breathe properly and yes. they just let them go. But she couldn't move. But or swallow or eat or anything. It's, it's pretty dreadful. I mean, it's, it's I, a horrible I, I, disease. You know, they talk about COVID like being a bad way to die. You know, you're on a respirator and all that sort of stuff. But because it's a public, it was seen as a public health issue, an issue that it's going to inundate hospitals, and cause a, a problem for the public health system, which would reflect badly on politicians yeah. and the public service. It got, I, I think, it got much more attention than something like what you're talking about, ALS, motor neuron disease, because it's not going to be a pandemic of motor neuron disease. But nonetheless, a lot of people die from it every year. I mean, there probably are some pretty serious stats out there you probably have. Yeah, I mean, it, it affects, you know, there's around 2,500 patients in Australia, but more and more are getting diagnosed. Um, there's also a misdiagnosis rate of, of about 9 to 13%. So, you know, that's why neurologists, we want to give them better information. But but to your point, I think the burden of the disease is economically ah. still costly. Carers, um, the amount of support that's needed. So you're looking at about $1.5 million per patient for the lifetime of the patient. So in terms of a... a, a econometrics point of view for the government, you know, you would think that there's an argument there that if we can get to better screening, I think there's nationwide screening right now on consultation with neurologists. And we're used to that. This is a good time to do it, by the way. We're used to getting it. We are. We never used to be before, but, we know, we might maybe more acceptable. We need some like you to sell it into the uh, to the nation and we need to sell this, the, the story in, yeah. which is goes back to Jeannie, us, so. Genius was formed by you and others yes. um, to build up informational data and valuable information about how you use diagnosis to put our Australian community or any community for that matter 
into a better position in terms of either treating it or at least diagnosing it? Diagnosing it, finding new targets, and then creating treatments for those new targets. So there are treatments? Yes, everyone's developing, we're developing them, people around the world are developing them. And one of the things people are thinking seriously about is if you do have a, a known validated mutation, is early treatment before symptoms occur. Right. We've seen that in other conditions like spinal muscular atrophy and a drug called Spinraza, which is a very successful drug. And so that would be one avenue. You could go, okay, if you've got SOD1, maybe we start treating you a bit earlier, maybe at an age onset we start, start doing that, for example. Or, hey, we've discovered these other two or three mutations. We can target them with RNA therapies, which we're working on with the parent in Perth. Um, antisense oligo- oligonucleotides, similar to the message RNA therapies, um, but a little bit different. Um, but yeah, let's get them into compassionate use, into trials to stop this mutation from expressing um, or to encourage it to express depending on what, what we find. So what's the, what's the commercial proposition of Genius? So number one, the same advances have been made in cancer with different platform companies. So Grail, Tempus, Freenome, Alkin very commercial companies and the way their business model basically uh, exists is that you do discovery or collaboration agreements with pharma. So that's an upfront payment where they access your data, they do a discovery project with you and then a revenue share on the end. They come along and they do a collab with you. They say, okay, Matt, um, we really like what you're doing in relation to this. Um, We're going to try and build a drug for it, um, but we need your data. Yeah, they give you an upfront payment. And then you just do a, a royalty or a revenue share on, on sales at the end. So it's that or, or a company might come to us because and say, look, we want to look at Parkinson's, right? If we get you the data, can you run it through your models right. and see if you can identify a new target or a biomarker? We yeah. say yes and the same mechanic. So upfront payment and then a, a royalty share at the end. And a biomarker being um, something that – is common for people who suffer from Parkinson's disease. It sits in your your in your biology. Let's just call it your biology yes. of your body. Some so it's a, there's something a protein. It could be a protein. Could that, be a protein. You know, it could be like for prostate cancer. It could be the PSA. Yeah, as a biomarker. Exactly. A, as a as a level. So, but for Parkinson's, there, there's something else. I mean, there, for dementia, it's uh, some other thing, uh, some sort of a protein that sits in your brain. Uh, I can't remember what it's called. Yeah, now. alpha synuclein or the, there's different yeah, ones. That, yeah, and so, you know, you can get those tests. You can get a blood test, yeah. so to speak, and uh, they can sort of work out. There's a marker there. You be, you know, you, you have to get yourself onto some sort of program. Yes, and why that's valuable is if they're testing drugs, they can see do we have an effect on this established biomarker when we administer the drug to the patients. Let me just go full circle. Yep. And I'm impressed. I mean, I know a little bit about the area only because of personal interest, but uh, as an investor, but I'm not an investor, but as an investor, I invest in lots of things, but as an investor, um, you've impressed me with your knowledge of it, but you're an advertising guy. It's a leap for the investor to make because they've got to back you. Yeah, they do, and uh, they should. And I'll tell you why, because uh, at the beginning it was it was difficult, right? So I knew number two things. One, I didn't want to get laughed out of room, yep. and number two, I knew it was going to be difficult to bring the scientific community on board. But I did my reps and I did my homework. I met with neurologists. I met with people at the Garvin. They were super helpful. And one of them is on our board now. Um, I did my time for two years, right, trying to get respect and credibility, which I've now got, at least in Australia. I've also published about seven papers on ALS. And so I've done my time. I, I know the disease very well. Um, I'm still cognizant of, of that fact. And, and so what we've done is try and build a team of staff with very specific domain experience and advisors around us that are world class. Right. Best of key opinion leaders in ALS, best advisors on messenger RNA therapy or RNA therapy in the world. And then strengthen the senior management, which we're, which we're doing. And so hopefully that's enough for an investor. You know, we don't have the Stanford or Harvard person, right, which a lot of people look for. I don't think that equates to success, but a lot of people do. No. But- I, well, I, I, I sort of agree with your um Prognosis. I don't think we need that, yep. but some might because some might. a lot of people invest based on trend. You know, like uh, we'll follow this dude because he's done it before. Or we'll follow this dude because he or she's involved with um, Stanford or Harvard. It's sort of a lot of times there's no, there's no real logic there, but it is sort of a logic as well. 
you know, it's a, it's a trend follow. It's a momentum investment. Yes. So the momentum, you could get a momentum investment because m and is a, a thing, you know, it's worth investing in, well, the solution. You can get a momentum investment, especially these days with the, well, the COVID stuff's been going on because you can play the mRNA card. You can, yeah. Because no one ever fucking heard of <laughs> mRNA until more recently, but now yep. we, we know what that is. It's a treatment. It is, yeah. And, and, and it's now acceptable. Yep. You know, we've all had the jab, or most of us have, so we sort of know got a sense of it. Um, uh, you could so they're, they're two trendy things, trend things you could play, um, and you know where you miss out on maybe is oh, I'm not a Harvard professor myself. That's you. I'm talking about. Yeah. But at the same time, you said you've done publications, so yeah, you know, publications are pretty fucking hard to get. Yeah, peer I mean, reviewed. Like, really hard to get. Yeah. Mostly they get rejected. Yeah. Mostly. Yep. And uh, you know to get one, you might have had to put twenty in. And you might have had to take your first one and amend it fucking ten times, starting from Nature or one of the great mag, you know, p- publications, and, yeah. and then work your way down. That's right. But it doesn't matter. No, publication is publication. Yeah. So that requires quite a lot of research. It does, and and and, and it has to be um, quite uh, rigid and rigorously looked at. And you don't do it on your own. You do it with others. Yes. And uh, and you know, like the others. You know, they don't allow you to put their name on it unless they've reviewed it. No, that's right, and and they're very uh, they're an integral part of publishing is, is having, you know, co-authors and and. But do you sell that in to your investors? I mean, do you explain to them because that that's a really big selling selling point yeah. to me, the fact that you've you're uh, you've been on publications with others for this particular subject matter, that's a big deal. Yeah, most investors would know right. how, how the fuck that works. So none of none of them have done a PhD, so they don't know how a PhD is obtained. Yeah, a lot of time it's obtained by publication. Yeah, you can do it that way. I probably it, could have done it's it. It's probably way. the hardest way. Yeah, because often it gets rejected. Yes, some do it by um, um, thesis, but yes, but publication is probably the harder way. But it's really the best way if you can get that outcome. Then, to some extent, you've probably done a PhD. Yeah, I would probably say so. Pretty close to it now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but do you sell that in? Well, I haven't been. No. So but that's I think an you interesting should. point. Yeah, it's just something. Uh, you should look. This is who I am. Yeah. And just to give you a bit of sense of, because look, a great, I'm sitting here talking tool. to you, right? Yeah. To be honest with you, I think you're very. I'm not, not shy, but I think you're very. Um, you're an advertising guy, but you're not act- actually selling yourself. Yeah. A- and I, right. I think you've got to sell yourself. Yeah. And what I've that's dug out of you now is, you know, you shit. Yeah. Well. You might not know the answer, but by the way, no one else does because yeah. I've had exposure to these other dudes, neurologists as well. Yep. You know, like high-powered neurologists, they don't know this stuff. They don't know. It's a community still looking for the answers. Yeah, that's right. And as you say, whoever finds gets close to the answer might get a contribution from a big farmer. Yeah. Like, you know, like Very likely. Johnson Johnson, whoever it is. Jansen is what the name I was thinking about, Jansen right. Laboratories. Yep. So um, in one of my podcasts I had the – Head of innovation from US from Jans Laboratories on one of my my earlier the Mike Boris show many years ago and uh, right. it's fascinating the amount of money they 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 invest and the number of years it takes to get to ten years yeah billions of dollars yes into something that may not work or may work yeah drug discovery is a long has been traditionally a long expensive process but we can cut that down now with what we more do. recently we know that that doesn't have to be the case but yes. uh, but that is so that's your proposition I know what I'm talking about. This is you. Uh, I've got a great team with me. Yeah, fantastic. Um, I've done publications. Sure, I've been um, my 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 you know, fifteen years of skills in the advertising industry, and that's just so I can tell the story. Yeah, don't, don't let, let them use that to cut it's your throat. Good, yeah, that's a good insight, actually. Because none um, of these bastards can tell stories. I yeah. can tell you now, investors <laughs> don't know how to tell stories because that's why they're investing in people who can tell a story. Yeah, because they can't tell a story. But the next thing they want to know is where's the risk. Okay, I get the story. Where's the risk? The risk is this dude doesn't know what he's talking about or we're going we're gonna to get fucked over. Well, he doesn't know what he's talking about relative to everyone else in the marketplace. Yeah, and we're, we're – It's a relative game. Yeah, we've got valid milestones and proof of concept, so but the, that's but, right. But it's about you, then you say about the proof of concept. But then gotcha. you've got to say, but there's a commercial proposition. You've all been through COVID. You know what, what happens when one of these things gets discovered and, and, and you know, a result, a, a remedy – or a cure, or at least a remedy can be a manage, management remedy can be put in place. Yeah, absolutely. You see how powerful it is. Yeah. Well, M and D is spread across this many places and so many places in the world. 
um, you know, like th- potentially it's a big deal. Yeah, it's a massive deal. It's it's, And these are going to be neurodegenerative diseases going to be the second biggest killer in the rel- developed world by 2040. So it's overtaking cancer and behind cardiovascular disease. For me, the study of the brain yeah. and what goes on in our fucking skull yeah, it's huge. Is the most underdone thing. We know more about space, yes. outer space, than we know about our own brain. Yeah. Yet, and I think there's a rising tide around that commercial, a commercial rising tide or a rising tide of commerce around what goes on in our brain, whether it's dementia, Alzheimer's, MND, blah, blah, blah. There is, uh, undoubtedly. It's it, you seizures. Can see it. Yeah. Seizures, rare diseases. I mean, the, the the list is endless. Even glioblastomas in cancer as well. Yeah, it's, so it's, it's huge, it's a big deal. Yeah, and maybe the sellers get on the train, guys, because this is where it's going. Yeah, I mean, we've we've worked out how to you know fix respiratory things. We can fix the prostate. We can fix the stomach. We can fix cancer lungs. We can fix the heart. Yeah. we can we can do everything else. We can fix skin cancers, but this we don't know about. But this is the big one. Yeah, this I- is the last remaining part of us that's um, probably the most important part of our our whole body. It's the brain. Yeah, and we need to understand it, especially if we want to start to have all sorts of modalities of intervention, even Neuralink, for example. They're going to need, you know, maps of the brain. Neuralink being a must sink. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You're going to need. Well, that's a good example. Sorry to interrupt you, Matt. No, go for it. But Musk is, um, Elon Musk is, he's pretty good at getting on trends. Yeah, and he can see where it's going. Space. SpaceX, um, you know, cars, mat- batteries, etc., and uh, he's got Neuralink, yeah. which is he's telling us there's a big trend. So your investors should be thinking about this shit. Yeah, you know, like yeah. what's on trend? To me, that's why investors invest in early stage stuff. It's yeah. just on trend. They don't understand what the fuck's going on, yeah. but they invest on trend. Yeah, then they invest in the dude. Yeah, you or whoever is running the show. And you've got to convince them you know what you're talking about and you can drive the team. Yeah. Well, it's almost an irreversible trend. It's not as if we're going to stop using genomics no. to, to look at this stuff or that the brain's become, going to become less important. I it's, wouldn't be talking about genomics, you know, to be honest. I'd be talking about the money you can make when you get a collaboration with Janssen Laboratories yeah. or someone like that who's, who's you know, going to be exploring mRNA. I'd be throwing all the, all the cool, sexy words in there. Yeah. D- don't, don't be too medical. Yeah, no, it's 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 a good point. I've got to catch myself when I do that. I've always because I watch you talk. You, you over-index you, the other way. Yeah, yeah, correct. Yeah, only because you're not confident that people think that you know what you're talking about. That's exactly right. So yeah, you got to exactly. fucking say, "Hang on, I know what I'm talking about." <laughs> yeah, but let I me do. just lift you up a little bit here, a little yeah. bit of levity. Let yeah, me, great. You know what I'm saying? And then if someone starts to uh, uh, you know dig in a bit, then you can hit them up with uh, all the other stuff you're talking about. You know? Yeah. You know, SOD, I don't know all that sort of stuff. You can hit them up. You know what I mean? That's what I think. Yeah, no, it's, uh, I, I agree with you. I think it's a good good bit of feedback. That's your strength. You know what you're talking about. Yeah. Then give it to them. Yeah. And you, 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 it's, a, it's a punt. Yeah. They're punting into your business and you only punt into trends. You yeah. punt only will punt if there is a trend. Yeah, right. So show them the trend. Yeah, or easy, easy to do. Show Just them why it's remember. trendy. Yeah. Musk. Musk, Neuralink is a great example. If someone said to come to me and said, would you have liked to be an early stage investor in Neuralink? I said, fuck yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, play that game. Matt, I, I normally give her an opportunity to ask me a question, but maybe I've already answered the question. <laughs> well, no, my question is, uh, do you think you can codify success? You mean, you mean actually put it into a program? Yeah, or, or codify. like Because a lot of people right these days are kind of talking about structures and models that that the implication is if you do this you will be successful do you think that's true or do you think it's more like frameworks that that allow things to happen um i i yeah, I, I don't think i could sort of put it into a, an algorithm so to speak yeah um success but i do th- do believe there are some constants that you have there's too many variables but i think there are constants that have to be in the game like like you as i said you have to have a rising tide Right. Of interest. So yep. Musk is actually a very good person to model in some respects. Um, so the constants that he does in relation to everything is that he looks for rising tides. So space exploration, brain exploration, gotcha. you know, battery power, environmental sustainability, cool. 
Yeah. Cool's a big thing for him. It's gotta yep. be cool. Um, but then it's then it's big brains. So like, you know, big brain groups yep. who, who can work all this shit out. So that's another constant. He then has the ability to make it trendy. Yeah. Right. So his marketing capacity is ridiculous. Yeah, it's insane. So he's built this massive audience. So he just takes a view, I've got to build an audience. Yeah. Who are gonna right. listen to me. So that's another constant, having an audience. Yeah. Your own audience. Not, you know, not 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 an audience I can go on to Channel 9 and do a thing on a current affair at six, because that's a spray technique. Half the 99% of the people aren't interested. Yeah. What, gotcha. He builds a specific audience. So that's another constant. A specific audience which he keeps building. And he is ruthless about that. So yeah. there's another constant is ruthlessness. And he backs himself. So he never I mean, I don't know what his qualifications are, but you know, like he's now a battery expert. He's now a neurolink, yeah. neuro, neurological. He's a space expert. He's an expert. Everything. We all accept that he is. Yeah, it doesn't matter. We don't question it. And then he's and he's had this marketing thing behind him that puts him out there as a savant. Now it's it's a third party. It's not him yeah. saying it. Yeah. So clever. So I think they're the the constants in what would be an algorithm, but algorithms always. You know, it's just a model and it uh, a mathematical model. There's there's um, a whole lot of variables that have to get put in there, a whole lot of assumptions, and I don't know what they are in, in saying your business, but I know what they are in various businesses that I do, but they're the constants that must exist. Yeah. And and there's probably the biggest part of it is he does not ever undersell the risk. Yeah. In other words, he Be honest accepts with it. it. Yeah. Because investors know today especially – Big yeah. risk, big reward. Yeah. And you only want 5% of that money, of their money. Yeah. And people allocate 5% of the money to big risk, big reward. Cryptocurrency, big risk, big reward. Before, years ago, no one no one would do that. No. So that's another constant. He never constant. He never undersells risk. Risk, yeah. So there's no point going trying to de-risk the deal. Yeah, he almost sells it, right? He sells the fucking risk. Yeah. He got, he's thing. counterintuitive. Yeah. Because people go, well, fuck, there might be a huge reward in this. Yeah. So to your investors, don't undersell the risk. Don't, yeah. don't try and de-risk it for them. Yeah. Because the moment you start doing that, they start testing, they'll start testing all the de-risk de risk well, that's what happens. you come up with. Yeah. That's and then, you, then, you'll, then you'll have an arm wrestle and they'll win because there's their money and they'll say, oh, I'm not going there. Yeah, that's right. Let, let them have as many th weird thoughts as they want. Yeah. Like, yeah. You just say, this is a big risk, but it's a massive reward. Yeah. And then just keep throwing in big names and trends and tra things that are trending. Yeah, we're in that, that, we're in that era, trending. Yeah, it's a good word. Um, and there's a lot of them we can pull on. A lot of them. Matt Keon, thanks very much. Thank you, Mark. Pleasure.